Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Joel Auger. He's our special guest lecturer for the grand opening of the Roosevelt Science Center. Dr. Auger is a senior staff scientist in the material sciences and chemical sciences divisions of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, an adjunct professor in the material science and engineering department, UC Berkeley. He is the principal investigator of the Electronic Materials Program and the program lead for the Liquid Sunshine Alliance at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He graduated from Harvard in 1982 with an A.B. in Chemistry and from the University of Colorado, Bill Buffs, in 1986 with an A.B. in Chemical Physics. After a postdoc fellowship with the University of Heidelberg, he joined Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in 1989. His research interests include the discovery of new photoelectrochemical and electrochemical processes for solar and chemical energy conversion, and fundamental electronic and transport phenomena in semiconducting materials. Dr. Auger is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and has published over 400 papers in refereed journals with over 50,000 cumulative citations. Please help me welcome Dr. Auger this morning. Yeah, th thank you for the very kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here at Eastern, uh, particularly here during uh, homecoming week and the dedication of the Roosevelt Science Center. I also want to personally thank Professor Zhu Chao, who visited my lab this summer and has invited me here to speak to you today. Uh, uh, first, let me orient ourselves geographically, okay? That's a map. And that's where Berkeley is, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, just east of the bay. And, oh yeah, there we are in Portales, uh, just over the border from Texas, where I was yesterday. Thank you, Quentin, for driving me <laughs> from the Amarillo Airport. Um, now let's zoom in a little bit, and I'll introduce the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, it's the oldest of the uh, universities in the UC system, founded over 150 years ago. And for over 50 years, it was just the University of California because UCLA came along in 1919, as they said, 50 years later. Now there's 10 universities in the UC system. Who can name one besides UCLA and Berkeley? Okay, let's go start in the south, maybe down by... San Diego. Exactly. Three in the LA area. LA. Nope. Irvine and Riverside. On the coast, Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz in the Bay Area, UCSF, and uh, UC Berkeley in the Central Valley, Davis and Merced. And altogether, uh, the UC system as a whole is a world-leading enterprise in education and research. Now, way back at the start, uh, what was driving the California economy? Uh, it was only uh, 20, a little less than 20 years after the gold rush, and resource extraction was a super important part of the California economy. So it's no surprise that uh, when it came to the first technical uh, departments to be founded, there's a mining department right there at the start. And that's the origin of the department that I'm, I'm in it. The, the name now is uh, Material Science and Engineering, but it used to be Mining Engineering. And actually, fun fact, mining's coming back. Uh, all the lithium ion batteries that you have in your phones and increasingly in vehicles uh, need lithium. And uh, it's a good question where are we are going to get that lithium from? Mines in China, mines in the USA, we'll see. And we have research going on in that area. Uh, uh, UC Berkeley was fortu fortunate to have another connection to mining. I'm showing here a picture of Phoebe Hurst. Uh, she was the spouse of George Hurst, who made his fortune in mining. Her son is also famous, William Randolph Hurst, uh, known for newspaper publishing and being uh, the protagonist, loosely, of the movie uh, Citizen Kane. And 
She was an advocate, as you can see here, for women's education, and also uh, funded a lot of the buildings that we have on campus, including the building that houses our department, the Hearst Memorial Mining Building. And uh, I show some historical pictures of the building. I think it's as beautiful now as it was when it was constructed around the turn of the last century. You can see the cars are changing. This is a rather old one here. These are newer ones here. Actually, now it's mostly Lyft and Uber drivers in front of the, in front of the building. The trees have gotten larger, but it remains, uh, it remains beautiful. Uh, I have to give an historical note. Uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, who is a pioneer in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, in fact, the little b in Boltzmann's constant was, of course, named for him. And in addition to being a leader in those scientific fields, I think he was also uh, appreciative of diversity in architecture because he makes the following comment about Stanford. Stanford is laid out in a unified manner. In fact, at Stanford, all the buildings look the same. They're all kind of Spanish revival with red stucco or red tile roofs. Whereas Berkeley is, the buildings all look a bit different. And someone who pioneered the concept of entropy would certainly notice that. And he felt that the, the Berkeley is the loveliest place one can imagine and very suitable for education. And I can't disagree with him. So, oops, we're stuck. Let's see if we can unstick here. There we go. Let's go back one. Right. So, right. So our department has changed in its mission a little bit since the mining days. Uh, we are uh, very supportive of our student body, and we have a of course, an educational mission for them. We're also very involved in research. I'll get into some of that a bit later. Also, being a public university, just like this one, we encourage a public service and a professional service for our graduates. Many have gone on to found startup companies and be leaders in their, in their fields. Uh, I, I show some of the areas of research that we're involved in here. Uh, my area and is down here in energy materials. And I mentioned also the lithium ion batteries. We have a very strong program in that area, covering everything from how to mine the material to making better batteries, and also uh, looking at the full picture, how we will recycle them in the, in the future. Uh, we have quite a few research facilities that help us in our research. I saw some of the ones here that are located on the campus. And then all the ones at the bottom say Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. There's a big building here, an electron microscopy center. And that gives me the opportunity to, to introduce the second institution that I'm from, which is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It's located right next to the UC Berkeley campus. In fact, the Hearst Mining Building is here. And there's the big synchrotron that's at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So they're right next door to each other. The lab's on a, on a hill just east of campus. And uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory also has a rich history. It was the first national lab in this country, founded in, in uh, 1931. Soon after Ernest Lawrence discovered the cyclotron, he uh, had the vision that he could scale that thing up to do uh, scientific discovery. And in fact, that's exactly what happened at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. We're known for the discovery of plutonium and many other elements that are heavier than uranium. I show some, some uh, highlights from the last century uh, close to the end in the 90s, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab worked on the sequencing of the entire human genome. This revolutionized the understanding of, well, life itself and also, and also medicine. Uh, always in uh, Lawrence's mind was a concept of team science. And I show a picture here from a building that actually still houses our X-ray laser source, our synchrotron. And you can see the diversity of people except Dender working with him from the uh, technicians building parts of the accelerators all the way to the scientists designing them. Uh, this is from the 60-inch cyclotron. Uh, it's actually right located very close to where my research is going on. Uh, lab's quite large now. We have uh, over 3,000 full-time employees. Many people visit the lab to use our facilities. Uh, parking is a bit of an issue, but other than that, we're happy to accommodate them. And we have a number of large research themes. Uh, one area is understanding the universe. We design uh, detectors for uh, 
uh, telescopes that look out into the, into the cosmos and also do calculations about how the universe started. I'm in this area, so you'll hear more about the discovery of materials for energy and the environment. We have a very strong program in high performance computing that's actually getting more and more attention these days. And I'm also involved in this area, uh, accelerating the development of clean energy technologies. So that leads me to the main subject of my lecture, energy. And I can't think of a better way to start this by quoting uh, Albert Einstein's take on the first law of thermodynamics. And you can read it. Uh, essentially says, we can't really create energy. We can just change it from one form to another. I certainly was reminded of this as I drove through, uh, that's West Texas over there, right? Uh, with all those windmills. What those are doing is, create, is converting the motion of the air into mechanical uh, energy in the rotation of the rotors and through generators into electricity and into the power lines that are running actually all over the place there. And uh, that's a theme that we will be uh, uh, following throughout my lecture. I'll also make a bold claim that it's the mastery of energy conversion that separates our genus from all other forms of life on the planet. Uh, there's uh, animals that have uh, language, complex language, whales, for example, uh, tool-making animals, uh, seagulls and ravens can use, can use tools, and ants have complex social structures, but it's only humans that have used energy conversion uh, for our own benefit. I show our cousins here uh, making a fire in a depiction from Wikipedia. And if you think about it, that, that really is, uh, underlies all of our civilization today. And I should mention, what are these guys doing? They are actually burning biomass. That's wood that they've collected from their environment. And we still more or less do that today. This is a complicated graph, a little hard to read in the back. But what I want to point out is this is the world consumption of energy in a scary unit, exajoules. And all of these uh, green, uh, red, and, and uh, gray bars are oil, natural gas, and coal basically the results of photosynthesis many millions of years ago that have been transformed by the earth into fuels that we found out to be easy to use for us. You know, digging up coal and burning it, uh, uh, burning natural gas, that's the main source of electricity in this country, and then oil, which we use for manufacturing you know, many of the things in our environment, all our plastics and fine chemicals and so forth. And uh, it's most of the world energy consumption. It's nice to see an increase, increasing proportion of renewable uh, 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 energy sources. Uh, this includes uh, uh, hydro, nuclear energy, renewables, which include wind and solar. But it's still a lot. And it's, the, the fossil fuel resources are very convenient. Uh, they, they only have one, I think, uh, besides uh, certain types of pollution. There is one little problem in that they emit carbon dioxide as a result of their combustion. I'm just showing one graph here, it's from NASA, that looked at historical temperature records from around the world, uh, dating back to 1880. I'll explain a little bit what's being graphed here. It's a five-year average of temperature in a given area, and if it's a bit hotter than average, the color's yellow. If it's way hotter, it's, it's uh, red. If it's colder, light blue, and then blue. And this is data from uh, 19th century. And as you'd imagine, some areas of the world are a bit colder, like down here. Some areas, Florida and the American uh, Southeast, were a bit hotter that year. But if I roll the film, as we go through, the, through time here, you see the same sort of pattern. Some areas are hotter, some areas are colder. We talk about that, you know, the changes in the weather. And uh, yeah, here are the 1920s, 1930s, and so forth. And what's dramatic, spoiler alert, around 1980, um, things are very different. Um, and that's within the living memory of some, but not all people in this room. Uh, you can see that there's almost no blue anymore. Most areas on average are, are hotter over a five-year average, than, uh, over a five-year period than in the 19th century. And this is, this is data, the most recent data. And only one little place is colder down there in Antarctica. Most places are hotter, including the, the Arctic. So that creates a motivation to think about the impact that our activities have on the Earth's environment. And this is not new thinking. I show here, the print's a bit small, but it's a uh, lecture that uh, Professor Chimichian gave in 1912. And 1912 was an interesting year. Uh, you would not have been able to take 
the, a cruise on the Titanic from the UK to New York to see his lecture because it sank earlier in that year. But you could take it another, another craft. You couldn't, you, certainly, you couldn't fly over the Atlantic at that time. And he was quite a visionary. And I'll just mention some of the things that were on his mind at the time. First, he, was, he knew because of the way that coal was made by uh, the transformation of essentially old biomass uh, under the earth that there wasn't an infinite amount of it. So we might run out of it. Um, and then amazingly, he anticipates nuclear power. Uh, this is before those of you who studied chemistry, before the model of the Bohr atom, before Bragg's law of diffraction, there were still arguments over the way atoms existed. He thought, well, if we ever get at the energy that holds atoms together, we could have an infinite source of power. He was somewhat right about that. And the last part is super interesting. Um, I won't read this. I, I would like this man to write my research proposals for me because he's so eloquent. But basically what he's saying is that if we could figure out how plants worked, how they take sunlight, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and make biomass, uh, we, could, uh, we could replace all of our uh, chemical industry. I'm actually motivated by, mated by, that, by that challenge, as I'll explain in the rest of my lecture. So this is a modern take on that same challenge. Uh, the print's here, small here, but it's courtesy of uh, Stephen Chu, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, a professor at Stanford, and actually was the director of Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory for a short period of time before he became Secretary of Energy in the 2010s. And this is what Professor Chimichin's vision looks like now. You can see the, the forms of uh, sustainable energy conversion. This is photovoltaics. Here's our friends in West Texas. There's the transmission lines that are also there. Uh, batteries to store up the power because the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. And here are some things we might be able to do with it. Power electric vehicles, which we do. Do water splitting. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, take carbon dioxide and make chemicals. I'll talk a lot about that. This is essentially what plants are doing. And also capture CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it away in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, for a long period of time so we can address the, um, the uh, issues of uh, its rising concentration in the atmosphere. So I'm going to start first by explaining how we might take sustainable uh, power generations of power conversion sources and do some uphill chemical reactions, as exemplified here by water splitting. Also talk about that a bit later. Do a lot of research in my, um, in my research group. This is my only braggy slide, so I'll just go over it quickly. We're going to talk about this aspect of my research. So here's some equations. Not so many, but just a few. In fact, if there's one thing I'd like to take you, you guys to take away from this lecture, it's this part. I'm probably emphasizing the things that Professor Zhu Chow has in his electrochemistry lecture. We're looking at a chemical reaction here. Water is on the left-hand side, and hydrogen and oxygen are on the other side of the reaction. And we're going to recall, I hope, some chemistry classes we had in high school or here, like will this reaction go to the left or the right? And we know from our experience that it's over here. The water in our water bottles is not spontaneously turning into hydrogen and oxygen. And why is that? Uh, the so-called free energy of a reaction, which you compute from enthalpy and entropy, shown here, the calculation is, is here, is so positive that this reaction is not spontaneous at, uh, under uh, ambient conditions. In fact, the equilibrium constant is this teeny tiny value, uh, 10 to the minus 42, which means that water is going to be in the form of a liquid in our water bottles and in my glass here, always. At, uh, under the normal conditions. Now, one thing that those of you that are chemistry majors might recognize, oh, what about this positive change in entropy? Because the free energy of reaction has an enthalpy term, doesn't have a strong temperature dependence, but also has a T delta S term, you can think, well, if I make the temperature really hot, maybe I can make that delta G smaller and smaller and smaller, maybe make it negative so this reaction would be spontaneous. And you can imagine this. I'll show quickly a slide I showed to chemical engineers, but I want you to you see the main points. What this is, is envisioning a system where we put in heat. We actually try to drive that water splitting reaction to the right-hand side just by making the temperature hotter and hotter. And then we imagine that we do some work by converting the uh, hydrogen and oxygen back into water and do some work. This is the way a chemical engineer might look at it. What I'm showing here is a calculation 
of just what happens if you heat up water very hot. Indeed, you can make a little hydrogen. It's the blue line here. Uh, you actually have to consider some other reactions when you get really hot. You can actually start breaking up the water into oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms. But the bottom line is, even at the highest temperature, I have 3,000 Kelvin here, which is unbelievably hot, you only have 15% conversion to hydrogen. This is hopeless, by the way, is what I'm saying, <laughs> okay? However, yes, but maybe all of you in the chemistry lab have done this experiment. You stick some wires in water and bubbles happen. Who's done this? Anyone? I should have done it here. Professor Chuta, you must have done this, okay? Do you do this in your lab? PNN now. <laughs> Dude, you have to do this in your chemistry lecture, okay? Sure. Because what this is showing, this is a YouTube video. Okay, let me go back and show this again. It's not so clear. Um, see how play. Yeah, right. These are just wires stuck in water. This is at room temperature. Bubble, bubble, bubble. We're driving that reaction at room temperature. How the heck do you do that? Now, what is it? Is there some magic about the electrochemistry? What's going on? And this is another part of the lecture. I hope you guys can like, remember. There's nothing magic about it at all. And I'll explain exactly how it works. Um, now I'm showing those scary reactions. Water going to hydrogen and oxygen. I also show another scary one, which is uh, CO2 and water going to methane. Uh, going in the left-hand direction, that's what happens when you cook or heat with natural gas. This is burning. This is combustion in the other direction. Of course it doesn't want to go that way. So how could we ever make these reactions go in the reverse direction of combustion? Uh, the, the free energies of a reaction are these giant numbers. Okay, they're giant to me. Assure me. I assure you that 800 kilojoules per mole is an enormous value. So, what is the key concept here? We are not going to do it all at once, okay? We're going to introduce a new reactant, okay? And that new reactant is electrons, okay? And what we're going to do is say, we make two half reactions. This one is two protons plus two electrons. I'm charge balancing here, we go to hydrogen. And we make another one, which is uh, uh, water, goes to two protons, two electrons, and uh, half a molecule of oxygen, okay? And if you add these up, they equal this reaction. So I haven't violated conservation of mass or anything. I've just put in these electrons. And I'm showing now a different energy scale. It's a later lecture to explain where this energy scale comes from. But it turns out that if the electrical potential is at zero on this scale, SHE stands for standard hydrogen potential, uh, this reaction is in equilibrium. That is, it's equally likely to go to the left and the right. And if you have another potential more positive, the reaction, this reaction will be in equilibrium. Water will be in equilibrium with oxygen. That's exactly what was going on when those wires are stuck in water. One is at a more negative potential than the other so that you can actually drive the reaction to the right. And the same math can be done for uh, essentially unburning methane. I show the numbers here. And so the basic idea is that you can control, okay, there's some complicated language, electrochemical potential, but this is essentially the, the um, voltage pro provided by the power supply in that video. You can actually drive these reactions to the right, which is an energy conversion direction. We're taking uh, electrical power and turning it into chemical energy. Uh, very interesting concept. And it was that what was, what, what was, what was behind uh, Professor Chiamichian's statement. He wants to take uh, light, also, but he's also anticipating it will go through a form of electricity and then turn uh, CO2, it's an uphill chemical reaction, to biomass. And uh, we're trying to do this the, the same in our, in our demonstrations. I'll make one more kind of depiction of how this works ge geometrically. Um, these are the same equations I had on the other slide. And this is essentially what's going on in that water splitting demonstration I showed you. You stick an electrode in, in one place, make it more negative. In this case, I'm showing a depiction of the evolution of hydrogen. And then you have another electrode. They're hooked in an electrical circuit, so we conserve uh, the, the number of electrons, and you can evolve <coughs> oxygen. And that's the basis of the rest of my presentation, which you can ignore if you wish, because I'm just showing you applications of this general concept. But this is how we're, we are going to realize the concepts that I talked about earlier in my lecture. It's also for the biology majors here. How many biology majors? Excellent. You can help me explain this slide, because it's not my field. This is how nature works. Uh, nature works by having chlorophyll. It absorbs uh, red light. That's why it's 
Uh, that's why it's green, fucking green light back on us. That's why it's green. And on this uh, energy diagram, uh, the excitation of, of, uh, of, uh, within the chlorophyll uh, promotes an electron, it leads back in my language, a positive charge, a hole. If you store up four of those, you can do the reaction I just talked about. In, in, you can drive water, the water splitting reaction in the direction of oxygen. The um, enzyme that uh, does that, maybe you know, it's called the oxygen evolving complex. You can actually have, and, and in fact, photosynthesis is used, the absorption of two photons to drive the process. You have another uh, uh, um, a system. They have imaginative names, photosystem one and photosystem two. For some reason, they're not named after the discoverers, okay? A Calvin cycle, I'm kind of impressed by that. And in this case, you're actually making the, the electron more reducing, more, more negative on the electrochemical scale. And that's used to convert, I think you know this, NADP plus, plus a proton NADPH, and NADPH uh, goes on in the Calvin cycle to uh, reduce, or to fix carbon dioxide into biomass, as I illustrate with those nice plants down here. So what we are trying to do is exactly that. We have sunlight. We have a, a semiconductor material, sometimes we use this, sometimes we don't, that will make positive and negative charges. We have them at different potentials, this is important. And so the more positive ones will drive water oxidation, the negative ones will be used to reduce CO2 or, or uh, reduce uh, water to hydrogen. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, I have to be a bit um, humble, maybe difficult. When I look at the way nature does this, I am really in awe. I mean, this is the, the, the structures that nature uses to do these processes are beautiful. I show some kelp here and these beautiful plants, and even the structure of the enzymes. This is actually the oxygen evolving complex. Uh, those of you who know it's structure, you see the four manganese. One, okay, one's hiding, but there's one, two, three, four manganese. Uh, atoms are used, up to used to store up the four positive charges you need to do water oxidation, and there's also calcium in there, and proteins that actually control the water access. To the, to the active site, really beautiful. And, you know, I don't know, here we are. <laughs> Here's two of my students in the clean room. I mean, we made this nice little thing here. I think I consider that beautiful, you know, it's, but it's in the eye of the beholder. And here's our nano coral. Um, there's like Nemo swimming through here maybe, I don't know. And then our, yeah, I mean, there's, okay. It, nearby, but not right here, there's cacti, and we thought this looked like nano cacti to us. But you know, basically, we're taking an engineering approach. This is maybe where the nature of my department, having material science and engineering, uh, comes into play. But we have a goal. Uh, we want to take uh, sunlight or electricity from our uh, from our renewable sources and actually, as I said, drive those chemical reactions to the right. So we got to figure out a way to do it. So this is where you may see a more of an engineering approach in what I'm doing. So back to the challenge, sunlight uh, to uh, chemical energy conversion. And yes, this is an example of our engineering approach. So we gave ourselves the goal. We want to make some, uh, uh, pro we call them C2 plus. These are uh, ethylene and uh, ethanol have two carbon atoms in them. CO2 has one, so we have to make a carbon-carbon bond. That's our goal. And we gave ourselves also a goal. They wanted to do this more efficiently than photosynthesis. Otherwise, why would we, you know, why, 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 what, what would be the point? And we thought about all the things in the, in the chain that would be needed to do this efficiently. Absorbing light, we have some power management. The, the cell that uh, has the uh, positive and negative electrodes is called an electrologist cell. We thought about the voltage distribution inside the cell, very much an engineering uh, driven approach, but it was also informed by some of the science that we knew about the materials that would be involved. And I'll try to uh, uh, weave those th two themes together in this little research vignette. Turns out some of the, the, uh, some of the work had already been done for us by uh, Professor Hori. Uh, interestingly, he had the field of electrochemical CO2 reduction to himself for 20 years. He was the only person in the world working on it seriously. Um, and he went through all the different metals. He poised them at negative potentials. They're shown here. And he just saw what products would evolve uh, in his lab. And actually, there's a few. Some like to make hydrogen. I, I list them here. Platinum's a good example, actually. That's, uh, that's an important catalyst for uh, actually both making and, uh, and uh, 
uh, both producing hydrogen and also electrochemically convert it back to, to, protein, uh, to protons. It's a great metal, it's just a little bit expensive. And some actually will make carbon monoxide. They'll take one oxygen off CO2, and those are interesting uh, metals. Uh, uh, silver is a good example, and so is gold, also a bit expensive. There's a number of metals that will actually make uh, formic acid. A uh, good example is lead. And there's one metal all by itself, and that's copper. And copper actually will make methane. C C2H4 is ethylene. Ethylene is a chemical building block in the chemical industry. Uh, polyethylene is its, is its polymer. All the plastic bags, I don't see too many here, good for you, is uh, made from uh, polyethylene. Also, a bit of, uh, uh, where's propanol? Yeah. Uh, 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 propanol, a three-carbon alcohol. So that's pretty interesting. Now I had the honor of actually seeing Professor Horry in a, in, a, um, in a virtual lecture a few years ago. I was a bit of a fanboy about it, actually, because uh, he was a real pioneer in the field. So we'll look now, given what I told you about Professor Horry's work, I'll tell you a little bit about how we went about designing our cathode. This is the thing we're going to make negative that we want to use to force electrons onto CO2. By the way, CO2 does not want that electron, so we have to uh, use some very good materials to do so. So this is the science behind what we were doing. And I, I'll just show it uh, pictorially. Uh, this is rolling up work by many students and postdocs in my group. And I just want to you know, maybe share a little bit, not explain all this in detail, but share our thinking a little bit. Uh, we have copper, and here we're making uh, little cubes of it, different sizes. And we're also controlling the um, copper as a crystalline material, as, all, as most metals are. We're changing the crystalline base that's, uh, that's engaged in the catalysis, and we found some interesting trends. Uh, here, it's an example where we made uh, little stripes of copper that are shown in red, and stripes of uh, of gold, which are shown in uh, green. We're actually using two metals together to get what we want. And where's another good example? Uh, yeah, here, here we've discovered that copper actually has a hidden talent. It'll actually store up one of the key intermediates, uh, carbon monoxide, for later, and then release it into the active site where we're making methylene. So this, this is rolling up about a <coughs> decade's worth of work of basic science that went into our electrode. So what we came up for this engineering demonstration was making what we called nanocoral. Uh, we used an electrode deposition method to essentially take copper, um, copper and silver uh, cations in solution, and then by running a negative current, deposit them in our substrate and make these high surface area structure. And uh, we think this is kind of beautiful. Little green dots are silver, and the red is, is copper. And for those of you who want to dive a little bit into the mechanism, what the, um, what the silver is doing is making some carbon monoxide, and, and uh, 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 copper uh, reacts very well with carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide to make the target ethylene, which in this complicated graph is the, uh, is the red bar here, and the higher this bar is, the better. We were also looking at the um, uh, resistance in our circuit, the green curve here is actually has less series resistance or overall efficiency will be better. Uh, we also looked at the part of the, the system that, that we need to do uh, water oxidation. This is where actually where we get our protons for. We need that to balance the circuit. And we made uh, some hollow tubes of iridium dioxide. This was interesting. We made zinc oxide, coated it in iridium dioxide, and then etched away the zinc to make these little, like, like, like penne pasta to me. Maybe not to you, but anyways, this is what they look like to me. And uh, these gave us, in our, in our units, a very, uh, very efficient uh, anode. If the, the, we have a very small so-called overpotential that we need to exert to make the reaction go. And we put it, we also, th this, is, this is very much engineering sort of thinking. We also th thought about how we would put the whole thing together. And we actually did a study looking at the effect of the size of the bubbles the carbon dioxide bubbles that we need to have in the water to keep it saturated. Um, uh, so we actually uh, used a very small, uh, this is like a glass for it to make small bubble, bubbles, and they were much better at keeping the reaction, uh, keeping the solution saturated as we were running our reaction. So we were taking care of all of this. And after doing all that, we 
ran our circuit with uh, an electrical power supply and found that we would get into a very nice uh, three volts was enough to make uh, significant amounts of our target products. You want to look at the, the uh, green bar here and also the, uh, where's the, and the orange bar here for uh, ethylene and, uh, and um, ethanol, which were our target products. And when we put the whole thing together and ran it with solar cells, uh, it looked like this in the lab. <laughs> Here's our, let's see, we have a light source here that's our so-called solar simulator. And it's shining on these two uh, solar cells here. And then in this posed picture, I'm twiddling with our electrical power management unit that's changing the voltage so we can more uh, efficiently power our electrolysis cell, which is, yeah, right here, that Guru is holding in his, in his hands. And uh, I want to stress the team science aspects of this a little bit. Uh, James Bullock here is an electrical engineer, and he designed uh, the board here that we're using. Uh, Guru Dial is the postdoc who did all the material science I showed you, you know, making the nanocoral and the penne pasta anode. Uh, and Ju Chao, do you recognize that hood? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's where you were working, okay? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and here's, a, here's another picture of, of our of our uh, cell in action in, in another hood. Oops, let's see if I can show the video here. Um, so what's interesting here is that <laughs> the cell will actually glow red at a certain point. If you look here carefully, um, as we there, it starts to, it starts to glow red. Um, uh, because it, for those of you who know photovoltaics, it's because we have a very uh, high efficiency solar cell. And there's our, there's our little cell that's producing small amounts of uh, ethylene and, uh, and, uh, and ethanol. So eventually, um, uh, I'm skipping over a lot of our intermediate steps, but I want to remind you, our, we set ourselves a goal to be uh, more efficient than photosynthesis. I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how efficient uh, so, uh, photosynthesis is. But eventually, we, we borrowed from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in, uh, in uh, Golden, Colorado. A very fancy solar cell, I showed you a picture of it. Uh, before that's very efficient. It's a research uh, silicon solar cells of the type that you see uh, on <coughs> rooftops and in parking lots are about 20% efficient. This is 26%, so a bit more efficient. And eventually, with our hero cell and electrical engineering expertise from uh, from colleagues of mine in electrical engineering department, we eventually achieved our goal. Uh, this is 5% conversion of uh, sunlight, simulated sunlight, into uh, 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 ethylene and, uh, and uh, ethanol, which was at the time uh, important. And I'll tell you uh, how important it is on the next slide, but also how we need to also be, again, a bit humble. Uh, we're not the only demonstration that's like this. Uh, there's been other ones. This is, uh, this is one from Japan, Caltech. Uh, this is, I believe, EPFL in Switzerland. And this is the Helmholtz uh, Research Institute in Berlin. So there's many institutes around the, around the world working on the exact same challenge that I'm talking about. But then there's nature. And if you look, if you do a calculation of what is the energy conversion efficiency of photosynthesis, you consider the amount of uh, sunlight falling on the place where your plants are growing. Uh, this is actually switchgrass being shown, this sugar cane in Brazil being shown here. And you know, the inputs are sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. The, outs uh, the out output is biomass. Uh, the best calculations say that uh, photosynthesis is about 1% efficient. About 1% of the solar light going in is reflected in the biomass that's made. Uh, under some conditions, it might be 3%. And we got 5%. So you're thinking, how good are we? However, we need to be a bit humble because we were feeding our... Uh, artificial photosynthesis device, pure CO2. And plants pull it out of the atmosphere where the concentration is, actually it's a bit more now, but it's 400 ppm. Uh, uh, plants also, in fact, in our case, the ethylene was like, mixed with uh, CO2. It wasn't in a usable form. And our ethanol was dissolved at dilute concentrations in our water electrolyte. And clearly, in uh, photosynthesis, it makes a separated biomass product. And actually, I should go on. This is. This is uh, also uh, plants uh, reproduce. And uh, uh, 
and uh, actually they rebuild their catalytic they, 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 they rebuild their catalytic center and this, they have a way of doing self healing uh, to keep themselves going the, uh, the enzymatic mechanism that, may, that does photosynthesis in full sunlight needs to rebuild itself every 10 minutes and our I, I'm not showing the data here, but the longest we've been able to run our system is about 20 days. So we have a ways to go. So um, let's see. Uh, okay, so we have a little. Hmm. So I have. So you can. Oops. Well, that one. Ah, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Whoopsie. Let's, it's detecting a device and, all right. Okay, so let's, come on. Okay. We're getting there. Um, Seem to okay, maybe <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> I oh yeah, we have tech through here, please. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay. We give it one try here. I'm ready to. Remote for TV. Okay. Let me see where. Okay. Remote for TV is. Okay. Okay. Turns out some of the, the uh, some of the work had already been done for us by uh, Professor Hori. Uh, interestingly, he had the field of electrochemical CO2 reduction to himself for 20 years. He was the only person in the world working on it seriously. Um, and he went through all the different metals. He poised them at negative potentials. They're shown here. And he just saw what products would evolve uh, in his lab. And actually, there's a few. Some like to make hydrogen. I, I list them here. Platinum's a good example, actually. That's, uh, that's an important catalyst for uh, actually both making and, uh, and uh, uh, both producing hydrogen and also electrochemically converted back to, to, protein, uh, to protons. It's a great metal. It's just a little bit expensive. And some actually will make carbon monoxide. They'll take one oxygen off CO2, and those are interesting uh, metals. Uh, uh, silver is a good example, and so is gold, also a bit expensive. There's a number of metals that will actually make uh, formic acid. Uh, a good example is lead. And there's one metal all by itself, and that's copper. And copper actually will make methane, C C2H4 is ethylene. Ethylene is a chemical building block in the chemical industry. Uh, polyethylene is its, is its polymer. All the plastic bags, I don't see too many here, good for you, is uh, made from uh, polyethylene. Also, a bit of, uh, uh, where's propanol? Yeah, uh, 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 propanol, a three carbon alcohol. So that's pretty interesting. Now, I had the honor of actually seeing Professor Hori in a, in a, um, in a virtual lecture a few years ago. I was bit of a fanboy about it, actually, because uh, he was a real pioneer in the field. So we'll look now, given what I told you about Professor Forey's work, I'll tell you a little bit of how we went about designing our cathode. This is the thing we're going to make negative that we want to use to force electrons onto CO2. By the way, CO2 does not want that electron, so we have to uh, use some very good materials to do so. So this is the science behind what we were doing, and I, I'll just show it. Uh, pictorially. Uh, this is rolling up work by many students and postdocs in my group. And I just want to you know, maybe share a little bit, not explain all this in detail, but share our thinking a little bit. Uh, we have copper, and here we're making uh, little cubes of it, different sizes. And we're also controlling the um, copper as a crystalline material, as, all, as most metals are. We're changing the crystalline base that's, uh, that's engaged in the catalysis, and we found some interesting trends. Uh, here, it's an example where we made uh, little stripes of copper, they're shown in red, and stripes of, uh, of gold, which are shown in uh, green. We're actually using two metals together to get what we want. And where's another good example? Uh, yeah, here, here we've discovered that copper actually has 
uh, hidden talent. It'll actually store up one of the key intermediates, uh, carbon monoxide, for later and then release it into the active site where we're making methylene. So this, this is rolling up about a <coughs> decade's worth of work of basic science that went into our electrode. So what we came up for this engineering demonstration was making what we called nanocoral. Uh, we used an electrode deposition method to essentially take copper, um, copper and silver uh, cations in solution and then by running a negative current deposit them in our substrate and make these high surface area structure. And uh, we think this is kind of beautiful. Little green dots are silver and the red is, is copper. And for those of you who want to dive a little bit into the mechanism, what the, um, what the silver is doing is making some carbon monoxide and, and uh, 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 copper uh, reacts very well with carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide to make the target ethylene, which in this complicated graph is the, uh, is the red bar here. And the higher this bar is, the better. We were also looking at the um, uh, resistance in our circuit. The green curve here is actually has less series resistance or overall efficiency will be better. Uh, we also looked at the part of the, the system that, that we need to do uh, water oxidation. This is where actually where we get our protons for. We need that to balance the circuit. And we made uh, some hollow tubes of iridium dioxide. This was interesting. We made zinc oxide, coated it in iridium dioxide, and then etched away the zinc to make these little, like, like, like penne pasta to me. Maybe not to you, but anyways, that's what they look like to me. And uh, these gave us, in our, in our units, a very, uh, very efficient uh, anode. If the, the, we have a very small so-called overpotential that we need to exert to make the reaction go. And we put it, we also, th this, is, this is very much engineering sort of thinking, we also th thought about how we would put the whole thing together. And we actually did a study looking at the effect of the size of the bubbles, the carbon dioxide bubbles that we need to have in the water to keep it saturated. Um, uh, so we actually uh, used a very small, uh, there's like a glass for it to make small bubble, bubbles, and they were much better at keeping the reaction, uh, keeping the solution saturated as we were running our reaction. So we were taking care of all of this. And after doing all that, we ran our circuit with uh, an electrical power supply and found that we would get into a very nice uh, three volts was enough to make uh, significant amounts of our target products. You want to look at the, the uh, green bar here and also the uh, where's the and the orange bar here for uh, ethylene and uh, and um, ethanol which were our target products and when we put the whole thing together and ran it with solar cells uh, it looked like this in the lab <laughs> here's our let's see we have a light source here that's our so-called solar simulator and it's shining on these two uh, solar cells here and then in this posed picture I'm twiddling with our electrical power management unit that's changing the voltage so we can more uh, efficiently power our electrolysis cell, which is, yeah, right here, that Guru is holding in his, in his hands. And uh, I want to stress the team science aspects of this a little bit. Uh, James Bullock here is an electrical engineer, and he designed uh, the board here that we're using. Uh, Guru Dial is the postdoc who did all the material science I showed you, you know, making the nanocoral and the penne pasta anode. Uh, and Ju Chao, do you recognize that hood? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's where you were working, okay? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and here's, a, here's another picture of, of our, of our uh, cell in action in, in another hood. Oops, let's see if you can show the video here. Um, so what's interesting here is that <laughs> The cell will actually glow red at a certain point. If you look here carefully, um, as we there, it starts to it starts to glow red um, uh, because it, for those of you who know photovoltaics, it's because we have a very uh, high efficiency solar cell. And there's our there's our little cell that's producing small amounts of uh, ethylene and uh, and uh, and ethanol. So eventually. Um, uh, I'm skipping over a lot of our intermediate steps, but I want to remind you, our, we set ourselves a goal to be uh, more efficient than photosynthesis. I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how efficient uh, so, uh, photosynthesis is. But eventually, we, we borrowed from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in, uh, 
in uh, Golden, Colorado. A very fancy solar cell. I showed you a picture of it uh, before. That's very efficient. It's a research, uh, silicon solar cells of the type that you see uh, on rooftops and in parking lots are about 20% efficient. This is 26%, so a bit more efficient. And eventually, with our hero cell and electrical engineering expertise from, uh, from colleagues of mine in electrical engineering department, we eventually achieved our goal. Uh, this is 5% conversion of uh, sunlight, simulated sunlight, into uh, 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 ethylene and, uh, and uh, ethanol which was, at the time, uh, important. And I'll tell you uh, how important it is on the next slide, but also how we need to also be, again, a bit humble. Uh, we're not the only demonstration that's like this. Uh, there's been other ones. This is, uh, this is one from Japan, Caltech. Uh, this is, I believe, EPFL in Switzerland. And this is the Helmholtz uh, Research Institute in Berlin. So there's many institutes around the world working on the exact same challenge that I'm talking about. But then there's nature. And if you look, if you do a calculation of what is the energy conversion efficiency of photosynthesis, you consider the amount of uh, sunlight falling on the place where your plants are growing. Uh, this is actually switchgrass being shown, this sugar cane in Brazil being shown here. And you know, the inputs are sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. The, outs uh, the out output is biomass. Uh, the best calculations say that uh, photosynthesis is about 1% efficient. About 1% of the solar light going in is reflected in the biomass that's made. Uh, under some conditions, it might be 3%. And we got 5%, so you're thinking, how good are we? However, we need to be a bit humble because we were feeding our uh, artificial photosynthesis device pure CO2, and plants pull it out of the atmosphere where the concentration is actually it's a bit more now, but it's 400 ppm. Uh, uh, plants also, in fact, in our case, the ethylene was like, mixed with uh, CO2. It wasn't in a usable form, and our ethanol was dissolved at dilute concentrations in our water electrolyte. And clearly, in uh, photosynthesis, it makes a separated biomass product. And actually, I should go on. This is, this is uh, also uh, plants uh, reproduce. and. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, they rebuild their catalytic they, 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 they rebuild their catalytic center, and this, they have a way of doing self healing uh, to keep themselves going. The, uh, the enzymatic mechanism that, may, that does photosynthesis in full sunlight needs to rebuild itself every 10 minutes. And our I, I'm not showing the data here, but the longest we've been able to run our system is about 20 days. So we have a ways to go. So um, let's see. Uh, So, ah, right, okay, so here I am. So um, I think I'll just go quickly through um, the largest demonstration that we've done, just, just to show you. Uh, uh, this one's not quite as efficient, but it's, it shows you maybe where the state of the art is. Um, let's see, where the video gonna play? No, let me, let me get the video to play. Um, so this is, uh, this is scale up unit. Uh, now you can really see the bubbles. Uh, yeah, so those are the bubbles of our, of our ethylene being produced. And that's our electrochemical cell. It's about the size of a piece of paper, about the size of the iPads you guys have. And uh, yeah, there's our power supply. We're running 30 amps through it, um, not small. And uh, yeah, there's our, there's our control. So that's, that's how big we've been able to scale it. And this one, this one we have challenges with uh, durability. This one lasts for about two days before we have to rebuild it. So we have to work on, on that. In fact, I have colleagues who are at a company that are scaling these things up even further. And the challenge they have is making them not, well, they, they have challenges with corrosion. They need to work on that. So I think I'll share just quickly one concept that we had. We also thought about um, how we're going to roll out our technology. Can we immediately take on the entire chemical industry by ourselves with the thing we just made in the lab? That's a fool's errand. That's not going to work. So we had to think about some things that <coughs> we could do that might be uh, deployable now. And the idea was to look at chemical processes that generate a significant amount of carbon dioxide as a waste product and see if we could recycle that. And I'll just tell you something that you might not know 
Um, maybe our friends in Texas know this because they do a lot of petroleum refining there. Uh, uh, ethylene, as I said, is an important platform chemical. So is ethylene oxide. That's uh, an epoxide. Uh, essentially, there's an oxygen between the two carbons of the, um, actually I have a picture of it down here. Here's the chemical structure. Uh, it's not the largest market as ethylene is, but it's, it's reasonable. It's, an, it's a precursor to ethylene glycol. And the existing process already makes carbon uh, dioxide. In fact, the chemical plants separate it out so that they can work, work uh, more efficiently. So that we imagined, actually, taking that waste product from ethylene, uh, 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 from ethylene oxide production, recycling it back in to make the overall process more efficient. This is the way chemical engineers think. In fact, the person who came up with this, uh, first author, Magda uh, Bereska here, is a chemical engineer. And uh, we looked at the, uh, uh, we, 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 our calculations, again, we haven't demonstrated this at scale yet, is that we could reduce the carbon footprint of EO stands for ethylene oxide production by, we're not quite at the gigaton level, but by 14 megatons uh, per year. And in our most optimistic thinking, we've looked at other uh, chemical uh, processes where we were, that already produce CO2, where we, 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 could, we could recycle it. And uh, these include natural gas processing. I talked about the ethylene uh, uh, processing, also the production of ammonia, which is used as a fertilizer here and in other agricultural areas. And the bottom line, where's our number? Yeah, we think we could, um, yeah, the number is small here, but uh, about four gigatons per year could be pulled out of the chemical uh, processing industry if our carbon dioxide um, uh, recycling concepts were implemented. So that's the extent of our uh, big picture thinking at the moment. So I want to summarize uh, just two simple points I hope that you remember. Um, one is that Berkeley, uh, that is Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and uh, uh, UC Berkeley are working to make new materials uh, that will enable sunlight or other uh, renewable energy sources to be converted to chemical energy broadly. Uh, we're working with very small molecules now. And we hope that uh, if we implement uh, these concepts, we can reduce the planet's reliance on fossil fuels and uh, reduce the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. Uh, I certainly did not do this work alone. It was a real team concept. And I show some pictures here of lab members and a long list of collaborators and funding agencies. Uh, there were a number of large projects, in particular the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis and its uh, successor, the Liquid Sunlight Alliance, that, 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 uh, that essentially supported most of this work. The um, Scala project had a nice name, ECO2EP. Most of the funding from, uh, well, Department. I was talking about energy. Of course, it's the Department of Energy of, uh, of USA that funded this work. Some work was actually done in all places, uh, Singapore. And with that, I'll share a picture of our building. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. Wow. Thanks so much for the educational, inspiring lecture. Um, any questions, comments? Uh, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I am kind of a structural biologist, but I'm ah. also, uh, I want to know you better. You can, uh, yeah, you'll you can help us with the our so catalysts. Kind of uh, very interested in the uh, extend my enzyme engineering capacity yeah. using the uh, metagenomics uh, yeah. tools. So you mentioned about the you know, kind of uh, you know the uh, artificial plant system, yeah, and uh, you compare that results with the plant system. Yeah. But have you ever tried any uh, cyanobacteria or any uh, any other yeah. you know photosynthetic bacteria? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, because I did go to class okay. very quickly, so okay. additionally, I like to ask you, you know, have you tried any kind of uh, uh, running any kind of system from the bacteria system, like uh, yeah. you know, engineer, engineer, we are getting more and more better PCR engine from the yeah. different bacteria source. Yeah. You know? Okay. So the, 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 I can answer. I have a short answer and a long answer. The first answer is no. I personally haven't done any of that because I I lack the expertise that you have. But colleagues of mine definitely do that, uh, and. 
But the other thing is, and this is why I like talking to people that are in your field, I think, this is the science side of what I do, I think about how enzymes work. And I, I blew through one of the, the, the slides. I, uh, I'm trying to, big picture, try to um, implement some of the things that make enzymes work so well. For example, um, I'm trying to implement signaling and feedback into systems. That's another lecture that I'm not giving here. Uh, but we do have some work, which I saw it ongoing, it was the work Yasol was doing, uh, that are, tr are trying to uh, have those functionalities in our inorganic systems. Uh, the difficulty in my mind with enzymes, but you can help me maybe break away from these uh, ideas, is that they require very specific conditions to work. Certain temperature, certain uh, uh, concentrations of electrolyte and so forth, and if they're unhappy, they just die or don't work for you. So uh, whereas the catalysts we're using are a bit more robust that way. Uh, we'd also like to have ways to self-heal. So yeah, we're, I'm very interested uh, in emulating enzymes. I probably lack the expertise to work directly with them, but you know, such people exist, there you are. <laughs> and also the idea that you can change the, the, um, the, um, the microenvironment, the active site by modifying uh, ligands and residues are a little ways away. I would love to do that. Um, that, that picture I showed you, oh, I don't have it. Yeah, okay, this is actually uncontrolled, but the picture I showed with the stripes, that looked like an enzyme to me, by the way. <laughs> I know, it wouldn't look like an enzyme to anyone else, but we actually had independent control over two of the active sites in that, and I'm looking at those sort of concepts to try to see if we can make our systems more selective. So, I kind of have a fascination with your field. You can tell from me talking about it, I'm not an expert at it, but I think that, you know, I, I sense there's a breakthrough out there uh, if some of the concepts you're talking about can be implemented. Thank you. As do, oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm a forensic science major with an emphasis in biology. I see. Um, I'm taking OCHEM this year, and I was curious, you said that your larger scale solar machine isn't durable, after, it's only durable for two days. That's right. So what, what makes the larger scale not as durable? Yeah, um, okay, there's a couple of things. Uh, okay, we know two things happen. One is uh, metals from our anode leave and go over to our cathode, and they poison, it's called poisoning. Uh, they start uh, directing the chemical reactions in ways that we don't want them to go. So we know that happens. Second thing is very interesting. We, okay, who's an expert on biofilms here, anyone? Okay, we want, okay, so we have something like a biofilm that builds up. We, we found that um, although most of the chemistry goes the way we want, some of it makes a small amount of a sticky substance called acrolein. It's a three carbon uh, oxygenate. And that thing polymerizes on the surface and blocks the sites. So essentially we have this yucky stuff that builds up on the surface of our catalyst and that you know, our, our reactants can't get to the right place. Uh, we're trying to like, essentially oxidize that off to try to regenerate, but we have not been completely successful. So those are two things that we know happen. Uh, and the si actually, I should say, the system still works. It just doesn't do the chemistry we want. Uh, we wind up making hydrogen, which in, in, when we're trying to uh, go after CO2, it's, it's considered a, uh, an undesired byproduct. <coughs> undesired product. So yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what failure looks like to us. We have, we're, we're doing, uh, we're evolving a lot of hydrogen. Also, the resistance of the system goes up and the energy efficiency goes down, and then it becomes, you know, in the big picture, uneconomical un to, to keep going. Thank you. Uh, do you have a time frame, or would y'all like to see a time frame of having the actual system up running? Yeah, so um, yes, we do. I mean, we, we okay, so here, here's an engineering answer. Okay, you, you can look at you know, what we would need to do to make a dent in CO2 emissions. So, uh, and then we, we go step by step. So, uh, examples are, uh, the easier reaction I talked about was water splitting. And that is actually ongoing. Uh, I have so many slides, I'm not gonna show you the slide. But uh, one, one way to think about it is that solar panels have become very inexpensive. They're made very efficiently, uh, various places in the world, in particular China. And you might think, well, 
after a while, we'll make so many solar panels that we'll, fulfill, we'll be able to provide most of the electricity we need. So why make more of them? So there's an increasing emphasis on using the electricity that comes from solar panels to do other things. So uh, there are now uh, electrolysis plants being built in China that will actually do the water splitting reaction to make the hydrogen. Maybe they'll use it for making uh, ammonia-based fertilizers. It's a good question how that economy will, um, will um, develop. So we can actually project, if that growth continues, we can project that out. And my view is that we have to get maybe five or 10 years behind that technology is where this needs to go, otherwise we won't be relevant. So in, in this case, the time scale comes from the needs of the planet, you see, um, yeah, rather than trying to extrapolate from my own research, because you know, I'd like to be optimistic, but we have some challenges. But the, at the field as a whole has to, has to uh, make some significant improvements to be relevant. Um, Otherwise, uh, other thing, we'll do other things like the water splitting, and that's the best we'll be able to do. So the time frame between the smaller scale model and the larger scale uh, model, what was that? Oh, good question. Yeah, so we had a, um, okay, so we, we, we gave ourselves two years, but then COVID hit, so it took three years. Okay. And we, we that, that, that video I showed you was, was shot, okay, in the last month of the project. <laughs> Because we set, we, we set ourselves a numerical goal, size and efficiency. And uh, as, as typical in projects, we worked our butts off at the end to realize that. So it was about two years. The team was a uh, core team, uh, research scientist, and a postdoc with a large supporting cast of uh, engineers and so forth. Actually, the entire project, project had about 10 people working on it with various amounts of, I mean, we had mechanic, I would go into all mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, a chemist making the, um, the uh, uh, making the electrodes and so forth. So that's about the scale of it. Uh, and uh, I don't know the numbers, but I was visiting on Friday with uh, uh, members of a company that are building even larger reactors. So uh, they have about, 30 people in the company now, so something like that. Students, thanks again for coming to the lecture. If you like to spend your summer in the Bay Area, exposed to the world-class facility, collaborate with world-class scientists, please let me know. At this moment, my travel, Dr. Montgomery again. Dr. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Uh, in appreciation for helping us open the new Roosevelt Hall and the Science Center, uh, please accept this plaque as our gratitude. Um, and thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. I'm really honored. Thank, thanks so much.